These are really positive outcomes, but there are certainly some risks. Certainly we've heard from folks like Elon and Nick Bostrom concerned about uh, AI's potential to outpace our ability to understand it. What about those concerns and, and how do we think about that moving forward to protect not only well, ourselves but humanity at scale? So, so let me start with what I think is the more immediate concern that's a solvable problem but we have to be mindful of it uh, and that is this category of specialized AI. If you've got a computer that can play Go, this is a pretty complicated game with a lot of variations. Developing an algorithm that simply says maximize profits on the New York Stock Exchange is probably within sight. And if one person or one organization got there first, they could bring down the stock market pretty quickly, or at least uh, they could um, you know, raise questions about the integrity of, of the financial markets. Um, a, an algorithm that said, uh, go figure out how to launch, uh, you know, penetrate the nuclear code in the country and figure out how to launch uh, some missiles. If that's their only job, it's very narrow, it doesn't require a super intelligence, it just requires a really effective uh, algorithm, then, uh, and if, if it's self-teaching, uh, then, you know, you got problems. So, so part of, I think, my directive to my national security team is, um, don't worry as much yet about machines taking over the world do worry about the capacity of either non-state actors or hostile actors to penetrate systems. Uh, and in that sense, it's not, uh, it is not conceptually different or, or, or uh, different in a legal sense than a lot of the cybersecurity work that we're doing. It just means that we're going to have to be better because those who might deploy these systems are going to be a lot better. Now, I, I think as a precaution, and you know, all of us have spoken to folks like Elon Musk who are concerned about uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the super intelligent machine, uh, it, it, there's some prudence in thinking about benchmarks that would indicate some general intelligence developing on the horizon. And if we can see that coming, over the course of three decades, five decades, you know, whatever the latest estimates are, if ever, because there are also arguments that this thing's a lot more complicated than people make it out to be, um, then, uh, you know, future generations uh, or our kids or our grandkids are going to be able to see it coming and figure it out. Um, but, but I do worry right now about uh, specialized AI. Uh, I was on the West Coast and some kid looked like he was 25, shows me a laptop and he's, uh, uh, this, this is sort of the, or not a laptop, an iPad, and says this, this is uh, uh, the future of radiology, right? And he's got an algorithm that is teaching enough sufficient pattern recognition that over time it's going to be a better identifier of disease than a radiologist would be. And if that's already happening today uh, on an iPad, uh, you know, embedded by some kid at MIT, then, you know, uh, the vulnerability of a lot of our systems uh, is going to be uh, coming around pretty quick. Uh, and we're going to have to have some preparation for that. But you know, Joey may have worse nightmares. I, I generally agree. I, I, the, the only caveat is I would say there are a few people who believe that a general AI will happen at some fairly high percentage chance in the next 10 years, so people who are smart. So, so I do think that being keeping aware, but, but what, what it, I, the way I look at it is that there's probably a dozen or two different breakthroughs that need to happen for each of the pieces. So you can kind of monitor. Right. It's sort of, and you don't know exactly when they're going to happen because they're by definition breakthroughs. And I right. think it's, it's kind of when you think these breakthroughs will happen. Right. And you just have to have somebody close to the, uh, the power cord. Yeah. So that you can <laughs> just, just that right right, right when you see it about to happen. You've got to yank that, yank that electricity yeah, out of the wall, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely uh, with, with, with uh, the president that it's, the short term it's going to be bad people 
using AI is for bad things, and there'll be an extension of, of, of us. Yeah. And, and then there's this other meta thing which happens, which is a, a group of people, so, so if you look at all of the hate on the internet, um, it's not one person doesn't control that, but it's a thing. Right. And it's pointed, it, it points at things. Right. It's definitely fueling some political activity right now. But it's kind of got a life of its own. It's mm -hmm. not even code. It's a culture. Yeah. Um, and you see that also in the Middle East, right? Which and is so, why it's so hard to prevent. It, it, yeah, right. because right. It, it actually gets stronger the more you attack it. And, right. and to me, what's curious and interesting is going to be the relationship between an AI, say a, a service that, that runs like that, and then you throw in Bitcoin, which is the ability to move money around by a machine. Anonymously. Um, anonymously, and so, so to me, it will be this weird. And again, this is where I'd, I think it could be embedded. If if you if you gave this sort of mob um, more tools to, because they are actually fairly uh, coordinated in their own peculiar way, and um, and so and, and and the good side is you can imagine. You know, I was talking to some politicians like Michael Johnson in Colorado. He's trying to figure out how can we harness these things to inform and engage citizens. So, right. so to me, the, the trick is. If the problem is if you suppress it because of fear, mm -hmm. the bad guys will still use it. And what's important is to get people who want to use it for good, communities and, and leaders, and, and figure out how to get them to use it so that, they, that, that, that that's where we start to lean. Yeah, I, this may not be a precise analogy. You know, traditionally when we think about security and protecting ourselves, we think in terms of we need armor or walls from swords, blunt instruments, etc. And increasingly, um, I find myself looking to medicine and thinking about viruses, antibodies, right? I, you know, how do you create healthy systems that can ward off destructive elements? In a distributed way. And in a distributed way. Um, and, and that requires more imagination, and, and we're not there yet. It's part of the reason why cybersecurity continues to be so hard is because the threat is not a bunch of tanks rolling at you, but a whole bunch of systems that may be vulnerable to uh, a worm getting in there. Uh, it means that we've got to think differently about our security, make different investments that may not be as sexy, but actually may end up being uh, as important as anything. And, and part of the reason I think about this is because I also think that what I spend a lot of time worrying about uh, are things like pandemic. You can't build walls in order to uh, prevent you know, the next uh, airborne uh, lethal flu uh, from uh, landing on our shores. Uh, it, instead, what we have to do is be able to set up systems to you know, create public health systems in all parts of the world, uh, quick triggers that tell us when we see something emerging, making sure we've got quick protocols, systems that allow us to make va vaccines a lot s smarter. So if, if you think, uh, if, you, if you take that model, a public health model, and you think about how we can uh, deal with the, uh, you know, the problems of cybersecurity, a lot of that may end up being really helpful uh, in thinking about uh, the AI threats. Absolutely agree. And, and, and just one thing that I think is interesting is when we start to look at microbiome and microbes everywhere, um, there's a lot of evidence to show that introducing good bacteria to fight against the bad bacteria is a strategy and not to sterilize. Yeah. And I think that what Although we I find... I still don't let uh, Sonny and Bo lick me because when I, <laughs> walk them, when, I, when, when, when I walk them in the South Lawn, some of the things I see them picking up but it's actually, and chewing on, it, it, I'm all okay, man. Indirectly. Stay away. You're, 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 you're. <laughs> but, but, and, and I think a researcher, Justice Green, was showing that actually opening windows in hospitals and mm -hmm. sterilizing the air may actually limit. And so we have to rethink what clean means. And, and it's similar whether you're talking about cybersecurity or, or national security. I think that the notion that you can make strict borders or that you can eliminate every possible pathogen uh, is difficult. And I, yeah. think, I think that, that in that sense, you're in your position to be able to see medicine and, 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 and yeah. cyber and um, AI. I think that's an important yeah. viewpoint. Absolutely. So there are distributed threats, but is there also the risk that this creates a new kind of arms race? Uh, look, I, I think there's no doubt that developing international norms, rules, protocols, verification mechanisms around cybersecurity generally, 
and AI in particular, uh, is in its infancy. Um, and part of the reason for that is, as Joy identified, you got a lot of non-state actors who are the biggest players. Part of the problem is, is that identifying who's doing what is much more difficult. Yeah, if you're building a bunch of ICBMs, <laughs> we see them. Uh, if somebody's sitting at a keyboard, we don't. And so uh, you know, we've begun this conversation. Uh, a lot of the conversation right now is not at the level of you know, dealing with real sophisticated AI, but has more to do with essentially states establishing norms about how they use their cyber capabilities. Part of what makes this an interesting problem is, is that the line between offense and defense is pretty blurred. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is, and, and part of the reason why, for example, uh, the debate here about cybersecurity, who are you more afraid of, Big Brother and the state or the guy who's trying to empty out your bank account, uh, part of the reason that's so difficult is that if we're going to police this Wild West, whether it's the internet or AI or any of these other areas, then by definition, the government's got to have capabilities. If it's got capabilities, then they're subject to abuse. And uh, at, at a time when there's been a lot of mistrust built up about government, that makes it difficult. And when you have countries around the world who see America as the preeminent cyber power, uh, now's the time for us to say, we're willing to restrain ourselves if you are willing to restrain yourselves. Um, the, the challenge is the most sophisticated state actors, Russia, China, Iran, uh, don't always embody the same norms or values that we do. But um, we're going to have to surface this as an international issue in order for us to be effective because it's, it's effectively it's a borderless problem and ultimately all states are going to have to worry about this. The, uh, it is very short-sighted if there's a state that thinks that it can develop uh, super capacities uh, in this area uh, without some 25-year-old kid in a basement somewhere figuring that out pretty quick. Thank you.